Testing. One, two.
Good evening. Uh, I'm Tony Contreras. I'm the president of the Tennessee Old League of Women Voters. I'd like to welcome you again to the uh, 2019 Board of Education Forum. Before I get started and introduce our moderator, I want to bring up some few housekeeping items that are a very important for all of us, okay? Uh, one of the things I want to bring up to you is the table in the back. It's got a lot of material. Two very important things coming up next year. Of course, the general election for 2020. And the very, very, very important item is the census, the 2020 census. Guys, be sure you get some information about these things. They're extremely important, especially the census. Uh, that's us. <laughs> so be sure to so are people walking around or you hold your hand up if you want to ask a question they have a next card that you can write your uh, question on and they'll pick them up and they'll bring them up to the moderator uh, so, you know, that way we can cover as many of your questions as possible uh, some other high speed items we have water in the back and also some uh, basket with candy to get you started for tomorrow uh, <laughs> Not to take home, but no, no, I'm okay. If you want to take it on, go right ahead. We made sure there was plenty of butter in here because my wife's face can be a breakfast. Okay. Uh, we also want, I want to bring up one important item for the League of Women Voters, and that's uh, one of our members, uh, Alice Slogan. She's been a member of the League of Women Voters for 58 years. Uh, so. <laughs> He's going to have a time teacher over here, okay? So not, not to uh, hold you up anymore, let me introduce our uh, moderator, Nancy Griffith. She will explain all the ground rules, and uh, I'll let her take over tonight. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. And at any point you can't hear me anymore, you can uh, get closer to the microphone. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the floor rules. This forum is devoted to hearing the views only of candidates uh, running for the Board of Education. To ensure that the meeting is as informative as possible, we ask that everyone abide by the rules. Audience questions and candidates' remarks must follow the lead policy of being concerned with issues, not personalities. I won't allow any abusive, personalized, or irrelevant questions or remarks. So if you move along from the time allotted and hear equally from each candidate, we ask that you hold your applause until the end of the call. And if you know uh, questioners use cards, there are cards available to write questions on, and address only those issues that will come before the Board of Education. I'll try to avoid redundancy and uh, also a short range of time. Oh, okay. Now, uh, the format will be a two-minute opening for each candidate, two-minute closing, one minute for answers to questions, and 30 minutes for rebuttal. So we'll go through all the answers in 30 seconds. Good. Oh, you can hear me. Okay, so uh, 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, the league has uh, come up with three questions that I'm going to ask initially of all of the various candidates, and then, uh, <coughs> then, then we'll go to the audience questions. And we're going to start <coughs> with Ms. Pyle and her. Hey. Hello and good evening, and it's on Facebook. Um, thank you. Ooh. Hold it right up to you. Thank you. Okay. Ready now? Yeah. Hello and good evening. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting the only City of Plainfield School Board Candidates Forum. The League established in 1920 as a grassroots nonpartisan organization whose purpose is to promote informed and active participation of all citizens in government and politics. One of the important local issues in the past and currently is the quality of the public schools. The Plainfield League continues to inform local residents 
through these candidate forums. And so I applaud and thank once again Plainfield League of Women Voters. I am Carmen Cedar Pyle, a resident of Plainfield, New Jersey for over 25 years, an employee of the city of Plainfield for the past five years, a parent of three young ladies attending the Plainfield Public Schools beginning with Head Start, and the oldest will be graduating this coming graduation, and I am a school board member for the past three years. As you can hear, I am fully vested in the Plainfield Public School District. Three years ago, when the voters of Plainfield honored me to sit at the school board meeting table, the first issue I was able to accomplish was to bring you, the stakeholders, closer to the board. The board was off the stage and you got out of the dark and at eye level. And as a result, I would like to believe that I was the one to bring transparency to you. When I knocked on your doors three years ago, your number one concern was the leadership in this school district. It has been a long, rocky, rough journey, and we now have a permanent superintendent, and I will support Dr. Diana Mitchell in whatever is for our children learning and succeeding. I appreciate all of you for coming out this evening, and I will honestly answer your questions and try my best to address your concerns. Thanks again. I would like to thank the league for hosting this forum. I am a retired history teacher in the Plainfield Public School District. For over 30 years, over 30 years, I taught in the, in the district. In my classroom, I created a safe environment for my students, very passionate about my, about my students. And my students had trust in me and believed in me because of, of my passion. Now, since I worked in the district, I have a different perspective. The first perspective, my concern is on curriculum. Keep the microphone close to your mouth. Okay, if you can't hear me, let me know. It's, I'm, used to, I'm, I'm a teacher. I stand. I don't sit. I'm going to stand. Sorry. <laughs> That's what teachers do. Okay, so first of all, curriculum. We haven't had a revision in curriculum in the last 18 years. I worked on middle states, the middle states accreditation seven years ago because we were a priority school. And one of the recommendations, because we barely passed that standard evidence of learning, was that we needed to write, revise our curriculum. Social studies, since, you don't, since we didn't have a curriculum, you don't have the latest textbooks. We have our textbooks are outdated. Some of our courses are offered with no curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be Ms. Anderson. Good evening. I would like to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this informative discussion. I am Lynn Anderson Person, and I'm very excited to be running for the Board of Education. As a parent and a child of a child who attends the Plainfield Public Schools, I, like you, feel that education is very important for both me and my husband. We live in Plainfield for over 23 years, and I have volunteered in many capacities locally. Through my involvement in our child's elementary and now secondary education, I've become very passionate about the quality of education that our children will receive. I've been part of the Board of Education for the past three years, taking an active, active role in trying to make sure our schools are being run well. The last three years, I have been on the Board of Ed in the Curriculum and Instructions, Facilities, Policy, Legislative, and Negotiating Committees. 
I've also taken leadership roles as the vice president and president of the Union County School Board Association serving 21 cities of Union County. To be an effective board member requires collaboration, creative thinking to make sure our resources are invested, our classrooms and our tax dollars are used effectively and efficiently. The skills I possess are my abilities to listen, understand what the issues are, and develop a plan to solve challenges. As a licensed real estate professional for the state of New Jersey, representing individuals and families, I learn how to work with people from many different backgrounds and cultures. It requires that I look for common ground, pitch in and help others to meet their objectives and goals if necessary, listen and restate to make sure I understand gaining clarity. I am excited to be here and I look forward to hearing your great questions tonight, providing you with a clear understanding of my perspective and also of my colleagues in column one, my running mates, Carmesita Pyle and Mac Rice. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Mr. Rice. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mac Rice, and I'm running with my running mates, Lynn and Carmen Sita, for the Plainfield Board of Education. I want to thank the League for this opportunity to address you. I also want to thank Eric for his service on the board and his uh, agreement to comply with the request to write information and thank him for his service. I also want to extend the relations to the League for 100 years of providing a nonpartisan platform for our citizens to be more informed and make more knowledgeable decisions. I also want to thank the League for its participation in the upcoming 2020 census. I think we're going to find, as in the country, the Plainfield demographics has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. But be that as it may, it is my firm faith and belief that we're all created in the same image. We're all created equal. And so it is my true intention to provide that same attitude to how we handle and manage our Plainfield school system. What I really want to do is accelerate, focus my efforts to accelerate the rate of success for all of our Plainfield students. This country is very lucky to have compulsory education. In the state of New Jersey, any all children aged 6 to 16 must go to school, be a public, private alternative. But we all know that to be successful, Learning must start way before age six, we have to age 16. So what I want to do is offer to our community my life and experience, this experience as a risk management professional, a financial planner, corporate planning. Thank you. Mr. Watson. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, last opening will be from Mr. Andrews. Good evening. Can you guys hear me well? I want to take the opportunity to say thank you again. Uh, as with all my colleagues up here, we appreciate the opportunity to talk and share our ideas and those things with you. My name is Eric Andrews. I'm a proud product of Plainfield Public Schools, where I graduated here in 1999. And I had the honor the, of coming back to teach as a teacher in the district for a number of years. And last year, I was elected to fulfill uh, the position for one year. In that course of time, I've learned a great deal from having an opportunity as a, to be a student having an opportunity to work in the district, and then having that opportunity to sit and decide some of those policies. I hope to share with you my ideas and again, earn your trust and the opportunity to serve for another three years. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. I won't go longer than is necessary. Thank you. First question, how will you engage with all stakeholders, parents, 
residents, superintendents, and other board members in approving public education. Okay. Um, how will you engage with all stakeholders, parents, residents, superintendents, and other board members in improving public education? Um, well, actually, as a as a board member, it's oh, sorry, I got such a loud voice. As a uh, as a board member, the only person that well, the, the number one employee, the only employee we have is the superintendent. Now, as far as uh, engaging with the public, it would be mostly in, in the uh, board meetings where um, people will come to the mic. Now, right now, it's supposed to be a meeting in front of the public, but not with the public. I'm not too crazy about that, but that is the way it's supposed to be. I would prefer to engage the public. Perhaps that's in a town hall type of situation, which we need more of now, especially now that we have a new superintendent. And I'm hoping that she will have more town hall meetings or more listening sessions where she can decide what she needs to do as far as our school district. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Andrews. I think an important part to improving education is fostering uh, a vision, an educational vision. And when people begin to share in that vision, they're able to collaborate and bring forth those resources that they have available to them. One of the, the things that I look forward to in the next two or three years is the opportunity to work with our uh, new superintendent to come up with a vision that's appropriate for Plainfield, a vision that, that speaks to the challenges that we have, as well as the, the benefits of all the things that are available to us, the resources. After we've established a shattered vision, then we go to the community, and that's in, in done in cooperation with the community, where we go to the community in order to build that strategic vision. And that provides an opportunity for different stakeholders to contribute those things that they have available, whether it's opportunities and in internships, abilities or skills that they're willing to come in and share with students in order to improve our public education. It is absolutely a collective responsibility. And one of those things in which we can continue to reach out or I'm always available. If you see me on the streets, I'm an open book. I'm, I'm quite fine with that, as well as emails and social media. Thank you. Hi. Hello. So in terms of how will I engage the parents and the community, um, one of the things that we need to do, um, and now that we have a permanent superintendent, is we need to start to begin to work on creating and implementing our strategic plan. The reason why we haven't done that um, as of yet is because we were waiting to hire that permanent superintendent. To do it before then would have been having to do double work. The purpose of the strategic plan is really to engage and talk to the entire community. Because the strategic plan is not done by the superintendent, it is not done by the nine member board. It is something that comes from the community back to us, where we go out to you and find out what the community wants, what the parents want, what the students want, what the teachers want, what the business leaders want. And then we come together and form a vision for how we would like to see our kids go through our public schools from pre-K to 12th grade. Um, the strategic plan allows us to chart our course. And all right, thank you. Just a fast minute. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I lost 20 seconds before, uh, but I do want to stress that it's really about providing a smart and strong leadership with performance-driven objectives. So I understand there are certain restrictions on how we can engage with the public. But what I want to do is work with the respective authorities, the council, to tell me how we can do it, not tell me why we cannot. I don't enjoy having questions presented and no responses given. So it's really within the rules, how do we engage with the community, engage with the superintendent, engage with our parents to hear their input, because we're your advocates. And I, if I get this position, I work for you. All stakeholders can enhance the academic, social, and psychological dimensions 
of the school experience and the skills. And how do we go about that? And going around the city, canvassing, I found that the average average layperson doesn't even know the function of the board, doesn't even understand the dynamics of the board. So, number one, the board has to do a better job of communicating with the citizens and the community. How do we do that? Have small group meetings and invite them. Go to their neighborhood and have these group meetings. You can also have professional training for them. You can have trainers to train them so they can understand the dynamics of education. Years ago, we had for the parents, we had the school leadership council, where every school had a school leadership council. And this council, the majority of the membership, 60% of the membership consisted of parents, where the parents were actually told. Thank you, Ms. Uh, keep an eye on the cards, uh, yellow and red. Okay, now uh, for the second question from the league, uh, we're gonna, going to start with uh, Mr. Andrews. And the question is, how will you demand accountability by administrators and the board as a whole? I think in order to demand accountability, clear and consistent policies need to be in place. Beyond the policies, when you have procedures and routines, it makes it easy to hold people accountable because you know what is expected and then what needs to be done. Oftentimes when there's gray areas it allows for people to get away or to do things that are great in the gray area. And those are the things which make it difficult to hold people accountable for. When we make it clear what it is we expect, not from just our administrators, but what we expect from one another, it's then easy to say that you're in violation of this particular idea. And I think that begins with taking a pledge from ourselves as uh, on the school board. And it, goes to holding those policies, or holding people accountable when they violate those policies. There have been occasions in the past, unfortunately we haven't lived up to those. The way that we would hold people accountable as a member of the board, we have one employee, that is the superintendent of schools. We have to establish goals with the superintendent of schools and then go about systematically holding that person accountable to those goals, checking in regularly to make sure and see if we're meeting those goals and see if there's any things that we can do as a board to support our only employee. Uh, we do not run anyone underneath the superintendent, so our goal is to ensure that she has what she needs to, so that her team can accomplish the tasks. Uh, so what we'd be looking to do, I would be looking to do, is to continue to support our new superintendent, Dr. Diana Mitchell, um, as we have done since she first arrived here. I believe we're on day 60, um, and try to give her what she needs in order to accomplish her goals. Thank you. The board's role is one of oversight. And as has been mentioned, the board has one employee so it is our job to establish guidelines and objectives for her to accomplish. We really have two responsibilities. It's make sure we comply with policies and procedures. So when you establish goals, monitor those goals, and work with the superintendent and let her do her job to achieve those goals, that's how our, our accountability can be established. First of all, school policies. The school board needs to make policies. Revise the ones that are outdated. And the school policy to me is like the Constitution of the U.S. It's the laws that we abide by, the guidelines. The superintendent is accountable to the board. The, the, the superintendent has to make the principals who are the educational leaders of every school accountable. Make sure they evaluate it, make sure they're doing their job, 
And if not, then there's no accountability. But it starts at the top. It starts with the school board making revisions of the school policy that are needed. And as a, as a retired teacher, I did go over some of the school board uh, policies when I was doing middle state, and there's a lot of revision needed. Because in order for students to have academic success. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Okay, so. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I didn't answer the question. <laughs> Whoa. It's a hot mic. <laughs> okay. Um, can I start that? Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> wow. Okay, so anyway, it seems like there's only one answer to uh, that question, and it is that the superintendent is our only employee. So it's the superintendent that we hold accountable. And we set the strategic goals, as uh, Ms. Anderson Person said. And from there, she is to follow them, and then we hold her accountable. So that's, it's, it seems like a universal answer. Thank you. To well, in reference to pop, something that was not in our policy manual. We realized that the students in the middle schools were using those. Um, and so we took the steps immediately to try and implement that as a policy. So um, in answer to the question about what we can do in terms of oversight, policy is definitely an area we can look at. And uh, there's a lot of work that we can do, but we have made some, some strides to make changes to the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, we're going to, I think, stop using the microphones here. Yeah. Well, you can try, but, um, but I'll ask if, if you have having trouble hearing anyone, please raise your hand and we'll try to do something about it or talk louder, whatever we can do. So now on this third question, we'll start with I'm sorry. On this third question, we'll start with Ms. Anderson's person. And the question is, why do you think you'll succeed in making a positive difference in the lives of students where others have failed? I think that I'll be successful because what motivates me to do this work is my daughter. Um, and I believe it starts with my passion and belief and faith that every single child that enters into one of our 14 school buildings is smart, highly intelligent, and capable. Uh, their parents, their grandparents send them off to school each day with a clear understanding of that. I believe that all of our children can comprehend and master any high-level curriculum that we place before them. Our teaching and management staff is critical to the success of helping our children develop uh, to their highest potential. I clearly understand that my role as a board member is to support the efforts of every single dedicated, highly motivated staff member that has the same mindset as relates to our children. Working with our fellow board members, I'll continue to push to raise the bar for our children and expect excellence. I've attended numerous trainings during my first term with New Jersey School Boards and National School Board Association to develop as an effective board member. Uh, I believe that 
education is truly the key to success in this country. And my life is a good example of that. I'm the great grandson of sharecroppers. My father had a fifth grade education from Command Sergeant Major in the Army. I'm the first person in my family to finish college. Education was my ticket. I am a strong advocate of education. I mentor students. I'm so involved in my, my high school, my college, because I know this is the opportunity. And I want children to have options. I mean, to finish high school, it's not a ceiling, but it's an open sky with a limited possibility. I have faith in our children, I have faith in our family, I have faith in this country, and faith in this system. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get the phone then? Uh, not quite. Do you have? I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I still believe. <laughs> Ms. Henry? Yeah. I've taught over three decades, over 35,000 students. I've made a positive difference in their lives. How do I know? Because in my classroom, like I said before, state environment, I build a situation, created and cultivated a climate in my classroom where the students felt valued and protected. I am very passionate about students. I'm very passionate about academic success. If I have had a student who was struggling, I made sure I got, if I couldn't help that student, I made sure I got all the resources necessary to help that student, to have academic success. Because that is what it, that is what education is about for students, being successful in school, achieving success. And that is what all students want to do. So my positive difference, passionate, cultivated a climate for them, work with them, go to their homes. I have been to so many homes in my three decades, over three decades, working with students in their homes, doing whatever it takes in the program, whatever is necessary. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, I, I feel that I, I have three girls in the school district, and they have friends in the school district. And just a little story. Um, I was taking, everybody knows me as a picture lady because I always have my cameras. And I saw these little girls and I'm taking pictures of them and they're sticking their tongue out. And, and I'm like, why would you do that? So I showed them the picture. And I said, see that? Now put your tongue back in your mouth and let me take another picture. So I took another picture of them and they saw the difference between their, sticking their tongue out and not sticking their tongue out. And I think right then, it, it may sound silly, but that little bit shows how I can in, do something, make them feel that this is the way it should be, not the way that you've been doing it all along. It kind of like gave them a positive look of, of, about what they look like and with this tongue sticking out and when, you know, doing what? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my teaching experience has provided me with a wealth of information and insight into what takes place inside the classroom. I've also had the, the, the honor or the benefit of completing a master's program at Seton Hall. So I have a, a, a thoroughly intimate understanding of how policy at the district level affects students. I think the way that I can bring that, that benefit or how I can be most useful is relying on all of Bringing those, that information to bear, sharing it with my fellow colleagues, my board members, is I think how we improve the students, or the lives where others have failed. Yeah, okay, now, I've gone all the way around, right? Got everything. Good. So now we'll move on to audience questions. And I well, take some liberties. Uh, I'm going to combine some questions and so I'll avoid duplication. Uh, 
So first, um, why do you want to become a board <coughs> member? And we're starting with Mr. Rice. Uh, I know that New Jersey has recently been rated as the number one state in the country for education. But yet, I look at the information for Plainfield, we're at the bottom of almost every measure on statistic. And that just can't continue. We have resources here. We have the opportunity to give our children unlimited possibilities. What was the question? Sorry, no. The question was, why do you want to become a Board of Education? Right. And so I asked my family and my friends, I'm hearing this call for me to serve my community. And I was not really ready to do it. But my son and my wife said to me, you got to get in the game. You got to be in the arena. So I'm taking the leap to offer my God-given talents and experiences to share and help the district strive for academic excellence to give our children more opportunities. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Henry? The reason I would like to become a board member so that children can be first. There are so many programs out there to improve the quality of education for children. I know, number one, we need reading specialists back, we need math specialists back in the school district to have those kids because an elementary teacher cannot teach reading. Okay, you need a reading specialist. And like I said before, we need to improve curriculum. We need to improve our curriculum. I want to also to bring vocational education back. When I first started applying for high school, we had vocational education. In this country we live in now, the 21st century, you need more. You need more. You need skilled people. Right now, the, the people in my generation are retiring. There are, there are not a lot of people to replace them. I just read an article. We need more skilled people, we need more plumbers, more electricians, more mechanics. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pyle, um, the first time when I ran to be a school board member, I have three girls, as I said, in the school district, and I saw what was going on. It was something wrong. They weren't learning like I thought they should be learning. And so I decided in order to in order to find out what was going on, it's for me to get in there and find out what is going on. And so I did and I was honored to win. And at now that I'm on the board, I see all the crap, for lack of a better word, that goes on. And um and so now I feel there's a I must stay on the school board. There are two agendas that come to the table, the one you see and the one you don't. And I'm telling you, if I'm off this board and the slate is off the board, I guarantee it will go back to the way it was where the public won't know what's going on. They'll vote behind closed doors, come back out, everything looks all cozy and everybody's getting along and the children will continue to fail. The children are failing now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Andrews? It is a question I probably ask myself regularly. It is very challenging, and it's a thankless job. But over the course of the year, I realized that there's work that still needs to be done, and I'm committed to seeing that work through. We started off by selecting a, a superintendent, and I know that she needs our support in seeing the vision or seeing our vision through as a district. It is <clears throat> inspiring, to say the least when young students come up and say things to you or they see the success that they have. And it's probably my passion for education, my dedication to the community that I've been born in that inspires me to do something. And that's my main reason for running again. Thank you. Ms. Anderson first. Yes. Um, the reason why I want to run again to be a school board member uh, is really, again, centered around being a parent. You know, we're advocate for our children from the time that we're born until like, forever. And we're the ones that have to uh, fight for them and to ensure that they have what they need. As a parent, I saw when I first started 
that there were things that were working really well with the Plainfield school system. We have some very um, dedicated teachers who show up every day, get in their cars, and want to do an excellent job. Um, there's obstacles that are in their way that need to be moved. Um, I saw that there was a disconnect between how the community was able to get in and actually see what was going on and what was actually being generated. So I also understand that this is something where the Plainfield School District, this can be fixed. People would like you to think that this is a very long, arduous, tough task. This is a very uh, simple fix. We Thank you. Uh, would anybody like a 30 second rebuttal? Yes. <laughs> um, Eric had said that this is a thankless job. I have to disagree with that. And when I'm in the streets or when I'm at an event or something of that sort, people come up and thank me for being on the board. So I must say that this is a thankful position to be on the board. And it's even more thankful when people appreciate that you're there for our children. Thank you. One of the most uh, inspiring things happened to me as I was doing my campaign, knock on doors, and people have said to me, God bless you for trying, sir. God bless you for doing this. Are you crazy? <laughs> so, no, I'm not. I'm just dedicated. I believe in our children. Anyone else? Ms. Education is a process. It's not simple. <laughs> It's a process, and every all the stakeholders have to be involved. <coughs> the outcome, the outcome, is what we do for students. Students is the main. Students are the main focus. They are our products. They are the future citizens in this country, and they are not getting everything they should get in the school district. And I can say that because I was a teacher in the Plainfield Public School District. And I know I did not have the resources necessary. Academic success, academic achievement. I didn't have everything I needed. So it's not simple. It's very difficult for teachers. Teachers, and everyone talks about teachers. Okay, teachers are very important in the process. Just real quick. Yes, and, and Eric, I think that by simple, I mean it starts with the fact that we all have to start with the uh, from the premise that all of the kids can learn. Once you understand that every single child can learn, you know, we can move forward. And it's a team effort. So I think that um, we're going to be experiencing a paradigm here in this district, and it's going to require every single stakeholder. And again, it's something that can be done. Um, it's how we start to talk about our city, how we start to envision what can be done and not just dwell on what the negatives are. Okay, thank you. Let me just ask, be sure and keep an eye on the cards. The red one means you should stop. But you don't, and I'll say thank you when the red one comes up, you don't have to stop mid-sentence. You can finish your sentence. But uh, no, it's a run out sentence. <laughs> okay, uh, now uh, this is, I'm going to mush together three questions, so this is going to be a little bit complicated. Uh, but uh, let's see. Ms. Henry, you'll be starting. You'll be first this time. Uh, one of the questions states that Plainfield High School is ranked number 341 in New Jersey and wants to know how we can change the rank. And how would you how would you assess the current state of the school district? And given the district's budget, upwards of 200 million, what role do you see the board playing in increasing the quality of the education in town? Focusing more on students, <laughs> giving students what, what they need. As a plan for high school is a priority school. Seven years ago, it came out of its priority status. Now it's back in. So what's up with that? Why is it back as a priority school? Because attendance, graduation rate, and academics. Why do we have that situation? So I feel that we can work together to move to move so that 
so that Plainfield would not be a priority school. We need academic success, and we keep talking about how do we achieve it. We have to give the students what's needed. We have to give the teachers so they can teach, so they can do the instruction, and the students can learn. And once the students learn, then we will be on our road to achieving academic success. Thank you. Ms. Um, you know, it's, it's really sad that it's 341, I don't know 341 out of how many, but 341 is pretty uh, low, high on that list. Um, but I will say this, that we had an interim superintendent. His name was Ron Bolandi. He came in, oh, pulled up the rug and found all the garbage underneath. And then he started cleaning up that garbage. And he started moving stuff around. Uh, unfortunately, that pissed off a few people. So now he leaves. For whatever reason, he leaves. Um, and, but when he was there, he stated, and that was kind of hard for him to state, but he stated that 70% of our children read below their grade level. He also stated that none of our high school students passed the algebra. So, and, 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 and he's not here with us. You figure that one out. Thank you. Mr. Andrews? So I'm presently a little bit uncomfortable with how we talk about success. Because students are more than the accumulation of GPAs or SAT scores. And unfortunately, that's mostly what the state looks at. But the reality is that in Plainfield, we have a changing demographic with students and individuals who come from diverse backgrounds. And so moving up that number from 341 to 1 is a great idea, but I'm more concerned with student outcomes. And I feel like one of the things that we have to do as a board and as a society is start to push back against unfair labels or unfair measures. We should be judging how we're doing based on how students are doing once they've completed with us. It's not always going to show up in a GPA. It's not always going to show up on an SAT score. It shows up in whether they can support their families. It shows up in whether they have the skills to access the different services and things that are available to them. That's the true mark of education, not GPAs, not SAT scores. Personal enrichment. Thank you. That's what I believe in. Can you read the question again? Yes. Um, uh, first, uh, there was a statement in one of the questions that Plainfield High School is ranked number 341, it says, in the last eight schools in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, another question, how would you assess, how would you assess the current state of the schools? And given the the size of the district's budget, upwards of 200 million, what role do you see the board playing in increasing the quality of education? Okay, thank you. Um, well, as Ms. Pyle um, had mentioned before, one of the things that we were able to do uh, sitting on the board um, was to bring on a interim superintendent while we were in search of trying to find a permanent superintendent. The purpose of that was the mandate for that individual was take a look at our district, pull up the rug, even if we don't like what you're going to tell us, tell us what, what the problems are. Because you can't fix something if you don't know where the problems are. So that individual did do that. He looked at everything, he reached out to the complete staff, and he came back and it told us where we were deficient. So our kids were below a grade level. But one of the things that we did was he came up with an action plan. And he said, look, and this is what we asked of him. He said, I'm going to be able to shore up the foundation so that by the time you hire a permanent superintendent, that person should be able to take the ball and run with it so that they don't have to come in and deal with such a daunting task of trying to Thank clean you. up the mess. Yeah, it's you finish your sentence. Oh, yes, I'm good. Uh, Mr. Rice? Well, I think, first of all, we have to stop accepting failure and set higher standards for excellence. And we have to identify the problems. I'm a numbers guy by nature. 200 million bucks is a lot of money. Over five years, that's a billion dollars. If we can spend a billion dollars, I think we can finally fix this problem. 
We need to understand where their deficiencies, what's working, what's not working. Take that 20 million bucks and allocate it where it's working and where it's not working, stop it and make a change. Evaluate your staff. I don't assume that everyone can do what the current challenges present themselves to do. That might involve more professional development, more training, uh, more uh, training. Make sure that the teachers can meet these current challenges. I don't believe that language is an excuse. We gotta stop saying because the students are Hispanic that they can't learn. They can learn. They have to be taught maybe in a way that they do learn to find ways to address Thank how you. they learn. Uh, 30 seconds for rebuttal. So I just to be really clear, it's not a different issue that they cannot learn. It is what is we, what are we choosing to teach them? Are we choosing to prepare them for a world that they're gonna go out to and live? Or is it that we want to have them reach somebody else's mark at the state level? When I talk about outcomes, I'm talking about do we provide certifications? That's important to me. And because at the end of the day, they can go out and get a job doing something, whether it's plumbing or electrician, and earn income. Are they going to college? Those things are important to me. Again, the things that the state puts their focus and concern on are the same measures that they're using in districts with all the resources and all the wealth. Thank you. Ms. Um, Embry, Ms. Embry. Oh, okay. Ms. Embry. The other thing, the other perspective is that what about the high school? Children come from elementary to middle to high school. If you come to high school and you don't have the resources and you are deficient, you are deficient in first grade and second grade. By third grade, if you can't read, you're going to have a problem the rest of your school life. That is, the reason. that is the reason reading specialists are needed, math specialists are needed, small classrooms are needed, if, if we want Plainfield to be off that 341. Because you can't do it at the high school. You got to, do, you got, you have to start with preschool, Thank you. kindergarten, first grade, second grade, so forth and so on. Then the high school. Thank you, Ms. Henry. I don't know who to rebut now, Ms. Henry or uh, Mr. Stevens. Uh, Mr. Andrews, but I'll just say as a parent, as a parent, when, that, when my child comes home with a 50 on a test or can't read a book on their level, it hurts me. And I know that if it hurts me, it's going to hurt them in their future. And so therefore, this is the way it is. When you, if you want to get a job or make a good living, you have to have whatever the school says that you have to have. And so, and, and when Ms. Henry is saying about 18 years with the same curriculum, well, 18 years, with children first, I don't think the children were first. Thank you. And I just like to, to point out what I was making about your statement is that as a board member sitting on the board for three years, uh, Ms. Kyle and I, we hired an interim superintendent to do that task. We put the person in place to discover what the problems were. We then turned around and we went out for a search to find a qualified superintendent that would be able to pick up the ball and be able to take us to the next level. And at that point, we have to engage the stakeholders. We cannot move forward to do what Mr. Andrews wants to do, what Ms. Henry wants to do, what Ms. Pyle, Mr. Rice wants to do, unless we find out from the community what you want us to do. Uh, Mr. Rice? In the high school level specifically, I think we've got to address that current problem. And there are learning techniques uh, response to intervention, where they actually go in, assess the person's abilities, find out how they learn, how they learn best. But it's a matter of expanding the opportunity and dedicating the resources to make that more possible for our children. That's pretty hard decisions have to be made. Just one more go. So we're going to go on to a related question. Uh, as a school board member, what would you commit to doing to reduce the 70% failing rate? And would you commit to developing a policy that would ensure all third graders are reading on grade level? Repeat that question. Okay, and we'll start with, sorry, on this pile. Uh, it all goes back to the superintendent. We, the board, uh, the board hired a superintendent, and she has five-year contract with us at CAP. So therefore, we have to make sure we have to hold her accountable. Right now, we don't really know how she's going to tackle this problem, nor did I hear it from her. However, I am certain that she has it on her 
or a, a, a pad or whatever to tackle the 70% of the failing students of not reading on their grade level. And it all goes to the superintendent. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As, a school board, as a school board member, what would you commit to doing to reduce the 70% failing rate? And would you commit to developing a policy that would ensure all third graders are reading the grade level? So as a school board member, one of the things that I commit to is making sure that I keep myself abreast on all of the, the different uh, opportunities, the programs, and things that are available there. One of the, the benefits that we have as a school board members is we have a direct line to the superintendent. And so we're able to provide her or bring to her those ideas, those things that we research that we think may be effective. Moving uh, students or moving individuals, I think, again, just takes a, a, a tremendous amount of reflection to see where students are at and exactly where those deficiencies are being caused by. And there's no way I can sit up here and tell you exactly how you would solve those problems without sitting first with students to understand where those deficiencies are really appearing from. But here's a, a quick thing just before we move on. Yes, I would definitely commit to making sure that our third grade students have been with us, but a lot of students are coming in after third grade. Some of them are coming in after sixth grade, after eighth grade, they're coming into ninth grade from some of the places with no schooling. That ultimately pulls down and affects those numbers. We had to develop a comprehensive plan for addressing all of those issues. Ms. Anderson, can you read the question again, please? Yes. Okay. As a school board member, what would you commit to doing to reduce the 70% failing rate? And would you commit to developing a policy to ensure that all third graders are reading on Grade level. Okay. Yes. And in, in reference to that feeling rate, when that was brought to our attention, um, when our interim superintendent was here, we set about setting up an action plan to address that immediately. Looking at the data, and that's what we're required to do as board members to look at the data and ask questions. Board members are required to ask questions until we get answers so that we can make the correct decision. We could see that the rate was failing. And when we looked back to see why is a kid who is in the 11th or 12th grade at risk of not graduating, it started much earlier. And so we set about um, asking the interim and now the permanent superintendent to ensure that we are putting the resources where they need to be, which is why we implemented the response to intervention program. When that was done last year, we tested every single kid in September and the program was evaluated again, and we saw that there was a tremendous jump in those scores, 30, 40, 50% by putting uh, retired teachers Thank that you. were hand-selected in those classrooms to help those kids. Mr. Bryce? I'm a firm believer that nothing happens without a plan. So we do have a superintendent that comes from an academic background. That's not my background. I am into performance and success. So we have to give her goals that we agree upon that are reasonable, that are achievable, and give her the resources to make that happen. I don't believe in goals of 1% increase. If you have a big hole to get out of, it's going to require an accelerated effort to increase the growth in those areas. So you've got to give that person the resources to make that happen, but also realizing this is not just a third grade problem because third grade leads to other problems down, down the road. Early childhood development has to be part of our thinking. And that there's a seamless transition from early childhood and then we come into our schools to make them continue to progress in, on, that, on, that, on that path. Thank you. Okay, so 30 seconds for rebuttals. I just want to say that the superintendent, Dr. Diana Mitchell, is there and she is working hard to address the issues that are there. It hasn't started yet, yet, but she does get my full support for sure. And because if she fails, my kids fail. And if my kids fail, all the students in the Plainfield School District fail. So I do believe that. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess with my time is that I've understood tests to be a little bit differently. Often when we look at them, we see it as just a failure, but I quite see it as something different. Your, your children didn't all learn to walk at the same age. They didn't all learn to talk at the same age. 
what's the chances that they're all going to read at the same pace? That everybody's going to be at the same level at the end of the year? No, the tests are for us to know where their weaknesses are and where we apply those where we apply our resources to improve those weaknesses. I heard Mrs. Henry say earlier that if the children are a product, and it, and it hurts me because they're not. The individuals, and so they require a bespoken education when that's particular to them. And the testing should be used to help figure out how we provide that to them. When we look at something as large as a 70% failing rate, it has to come down to whether or not the students are actually comprehending what they're being taught. And if they're not comprehending, this is showing us that we have to look at a different way of instruction. We have to be open enough. We have to be honest enough to say that if one thing is not working, then we have to be open enough to try something else that is working. And that comes from predominantly talking to the teachers, the people on the ground, in front of the students every day. Anyone else? Mr. I also think it would make sense for us to work with and talk more with our teachers union because they are the representative of that workforce. So I can't figure this out on my own. I need people that are doing the job now to tell us what they see, what they need, how to give them the resources that they need to be successful. December? Another perspective would be more professional training for teachers. And I think someone said that students learn differently. RTI, first of all, responds to intervention is only for elementary with the three different tiers. But what happens after elementary? Third graders will struggle if they can't read by third grade. And all the statistics say that by third grade, you need to know how to read. So what happens to those children right now who are in middle school and high school that are not reading? We need to go back to basic skills. I think just one rebuttal. And this is another area. Um, just one rebuttal. Uh, this is a general question. You may get an additional information on this one. Uh, what is your vision, your top, your three top priorities on how to recruit the system? And Ms. Pyle, did I start with you last? Yes, okay, so Mr. Andrews. My three top pieces of improvement, I would say one of the, the things that's been said a number of times, I believe wholeheartedly we need vocational training. We need opportunities that allow students to work with their hands to try things outside of a traditional type of classroom setting. We know that that's what's the change that's occurring. Right? There are blended learning programs and things that they're using at college in other different places that would help to introduce our students to those things. Second, I, I believe wholeheartedly, like uh, Mrs. Henry said, that we need improvement in professional development. What I've often found, professional development is most helpful when it's consistent across uh, the school year. With the help of a superintendent and communication with teachers, we can develop a plan that works. Um, is that question? Mm -hmm. uh, um, what is your vision, your three top priorities on how to improve the system? Um, the first thing would be to implement a strategic plan. That is paramount now that we have a permanent superintendent in place. Unless we have that, we're going to be spinning around and not making any kind of a mark. That is going to be our roadmap so that we'll be able to determine where and how we're spending our resources. We already know what's fixed. We know the salaries are fixed, healthcare costs, those are fixed items. So that would be one thing. Um, one of the other things that we should be working on is how we engage our community in terms of involvement. There are so many people that have raised their hand over three years and said, I want to help. I'm a parent. I want to help. I'm a business owner. I'm a city official. I'm a, I'm a legislator. I want to help. Show me how to help. The strategic plan, once we have that in place, will allow us to grab those individuals in our community, especially since our resources, even though it's a $200 million budget, you know, we need to try to use our resources effectively. So using the people within our community um, would be an excellent way to, to, to accomplish that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Rice? I really want to understand more about how do we get to this current position and how do we fix it. And that's going to take a lot of conversations with our staff, with the superintendent, with our students and our parents to really identify the problem and then have a plan to fix it. I also think that we need to uh, make sure that we stress parent participation in their children's education. It's not just up to the schools to provide that education. Have the parents have your school, your kid on school on time. Make sure you're involved in his, his education. Make sure you're involved in his participation for ongoing projects. It's not just the school's responsibility, it's also the parents. You have to think about parents more involved in this process. Ms. Hepburn? There's uh, three things I want to do as a board member. Improve the power of education through curriculum, writing, revising that, hiring better personnel uh, and who can contribute to improving children's life, the quality of education. And also, also on the curriculum, to hire reading specialists, math specialists, have basic skills programs so that children who learn differently can learn. The last thing is vocational education. I really believe in vocational education. Everyone doesn't go to college. 25% of the population in this country attends college. What about the other 75%? You need people today in this 21st century we live in need skills and vocational education is the way to go. Quality of education, improve it. That is how you improve it. Hiring practices need to be better. Oh, thank you. <coughs> okay. Again, we are school board members. We are school board members. We have one employee. Our employee is the superintendent. We do policy, governance, and the budget. That's what we do. So the thing is, we would have a strategic plan, we'd hand it over to the superintendent, and then we would hold her accountable. We would give her whatever she needs that will enable her to follow that strategic plan. And once we do that, then the other priority I have is to be transparent. Wasn't that a regular question? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I thought Ms. Pyle was the last answer. Oh, I'm not she didn't get a minute. But she, well, she, well, you only gave her a minute. Uh, okay. You only gave her a minute. You only gave her 30 seconds. You only gave her like 30 seconds. Oh, well, go ahead. Start the timer again. Oh, you, she doesn't need to. But just it, just to say that you know, it's the, we we do we do not go and do things. We do not hire. Um, we do not hire employees. We do not uh, hire companies to come in and teach. Them. That is what the superintendent does. We set the strategic plan. We hand it over to her, and then we say, "What do you need to get this done?" And then we help her get that done. We work closely with the superintendent. And then we evaluate her and make sure she's done what she's supposed to do. Okay, so now we have the bonus. Right. So there, there were three three parts of that vision I listed two. Probably I think a third important thing that would be tremendous help to us is creating a parent institute. Some of us, some parents, they know what to do, right? They know the right words to say, they know the right words, the right things to say, how to support the students. Others are struggling and having challenges. We're living in a new day and age. And providing that helps to build the support that's needed at home. It creates what I think is important. You need the community and the, the social organizations that are out there. We need the schools and we need parents. And it's a new challenge, a new day. It would be helpful as providing. Ms. Anderson, first of all. Yes. Um, we do um, offer support to our parents, and we could expand that in terms of we have Saturday academy programs and we have things after school that parents can um, participate in. But I agree that we can expand that out to try and make sure that we're reaching everyone. But one of the other areas I think in terms of the vision, if we really want to make an impact is that we must 
be honest in terms of what happens inside the district and start breaking down some of those walls that exist, those silent walls between labor and management, where people have to feel that their opinions are uh, received and open. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Mr. Ross? I'd also like to have a vision for having the curriculum expanded in two areas. In this global innovation digital economy, I totally need to be computer literate. And also, I want to see us stress financial literacy as well, particularly in our high school curriculum. Thank you. Mr. Although, uh, as a board member, you can recommend to the superintendent, we have a different superintendent every time the weather changes. So now we do have a superintendent for the next, I don't know how many years. Right. So when we want to improve education, if, I, if my perspective is vocational education, whatever, I'll work with the superintendent because I know a board, what the board does is a policy, but you also can recommend programs. And so the uh, superintendent can get that started, even if she has to get Thank consultants you. or whatever. I'll have one more question uh, before we wrap up. And this is a question. Uh, for all of you, uh, can you name a current board member who you think has done a good job and why? And uh, we'll start with Ms. Anderson first. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I would not ask that question. The question is, can you name a current board member who you think has done a good job? What is your plan? to reach out to Latino parents who might have language barriers. How will you encourage their participation? Um, repeat the question. Um, what is your plan to reach out to Latino parents who might have language barriers? How will you encourage their participation? You start, yes. So in our community, we have a diverse amount um, of parents from the Latino population, Haitian population. And I think in inner regard, no matter what culture we're talking about, it's about reaching out to those people that they best connect with. A lot of times you'll find that that's with the religious community. You know, that they'll feel comfortable talking to their pastors um, regarding what's going on in their lives. So one of the ideas that I had uh, as a board member is in terms of reaching out, that we can actually reach out through those avenues um, and go outside the box and talk to those, those other stakeholders, those religious leaders, and try to communicate with them. Um, and then also we have people within the district that are by people that we can set up sessions where we could have kind of an open house and have that kind of discussion with them. Um, but I believe that we're going to have to go find people. They're not going to come to us. We're going to have to go seek them out where they feel most comfortable. A lot of these, these individuals would be undocumented and might feel uncomfortable coming to a public school. Okay, Mr. Ross? I think first and foremost, we need to let that community know that we care and that they're not considered to be the others. We're all one community, we're all created equal. I think that's important. One of the first things I did in my marketing for my campaign is I wanted to make sure I reached out to that community. I went through the painstaking process to make sure my worth and children properly. And we have on our thing, Pot of Israel's Heels. Everything that we put out was also done.